Okay, I'll admit it, I'm a bit of a snob when it comes to media. A contrarian and a curmudgeon at times. I've tried to keep this channel somewhat positive so far, but you may not want to hear the opinions I have about some of the most popular shows that a lot of people consider peak fiction. But there's a lot of bad anime out there, and I mean really bad. So I wondered, if I sit down and put myself through a gauntlet of the 10 most awful, what, <laughs> what, uh, universally reviled uh, uh, anime of all time, will I come out the other end with a newfound ability to go with the flow, turn my brain off, and let people enjoy things? Or will I just mentally scar myself and never want to watch anime again? To find out, I sorted every single anime on the biggest anime ranking site in the West, my anime list, by highest rated, and then, because there's no option to go in reverse order, scrolled through 265 pages to get to the absolute bottom of the barrel. That was my first mistake. My second mistake was not filtering out all the porn first. Ah, yeah, shut it down. I can't put this on YouTube. So after making a couple tweaks, I had a complete list of the eye-shrivelingly unbearable drivel that is least worthy of my time and committed god knows how many hours of my life to sit down and watch all of it. And at the end of each section, I'll tell you whether each one deserves to be in the bottom 10, in my opinion. And to my surprise, sitting at the number 8th most hated anime of all time is a series that was produced less than 5 years ago by a major player in the industry. I knew it was bad, but I'm honestly surprised that it's even possible to make it into the highly coveted bottom 10 list as a series from a major company in such a crowded field of micro-budget short film and OVA contenders over several decades. Can you guess what it is? I bet you can. Stick around to find out. This was originally planned to be one video, but it was getting way too long, so I decided to split it up. So this is part one of two. So without further ado, I present to you the 10th most hated anime of all time. Twinkle Nora Rock Me is the second of two OVAs from 1985 based on a 1980 manga called Twinkle Nora, the first of which is titled simply Nora. But that one is only rated 13,106th, not 13,243rd, and thus doesn't make it onto the list. I will not settle for just incredibly bad, I'm here for only the absolute worst. So we go in blind. And little did I know that I would be met right off the bat with the holy grail of so bad it's good anime. Pony video. If you say so. We open with the Hunchback of Notre Dame recounting a prophecy about a bewitching girl who would lead the world to its end. That must be the bewitching girl. Oh lord, she's massive! After the opening, we're dropped into the middle of the action. The fourth doctor has seemingly randomly taken a hostage at the future airport. So we've only got about one frame per second here, it seems like. But I was being a little too harsh. It was actually two frames per second. Ah yes, a controversial move that some said would not pay off to hire only key animators and do no in-betweens. You know what really shocks me about this is that they're not even doing any frame spacing to like try to make some of the motions look more natural. It's literally just frame, 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 frame. What? <laughs> what? What? Uh, oh. He's slipping on the ice. And we're introduced to our hero, the bounty hunter Nora Scholar. Wait, her last name is Scholar? And just before the kidnapper is able to get away, it's rude to take hostages, come on. With a glint of her goggles, Nora valiantly turns the hostage into an abominable gremlin and causes her to fade into the ether. <laughs> Hold on. Oh. All right, I'm on board with this one. And we find out that that was actually a mind trick and that Nora has some indescribable psychic powers, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, there's a real Sakuga moment in here. Whoa, look at that animation. Hot damn. What was that, like six frames of a walk cycle? They're really pulling out the big guns now. So Nora jets off <laughs> to a planet that is definitely not Tatooine called, I shit you not, Planet Dazzle, and shows up in style on this sick little hover glider thing. Sick! In a moment that is, all jokes aside, actually really well done for the level of resources that I'm sure this production had. And I'll admit it, at this point I was starting to get charmed by Nora's wily psychic ways. I gotta say, near complete lack of animation aside, this one's kinda 
great so far. I don't know why this is in the bottom 10. She enters a bar populated exclusively by sexual predators and one... <laughs> I want more of this guy. I had no idea how lucky I was gonna get. Oh, there he is. <laughs> oh, she can freeze time too. She orders a and quickly gets the attention of a very large man. That's just what I was gonna say. Who we find out is Tochino, brother of Fuchiro, the guy from the very start, who apparently is a wizard and whom Nora has apparently been looking for this whole time. Nora embarrasses Tochino with her arsenal of random, unrelated psychic powers. Oh, and telepathy, why not? Hey, editing John here. Sorry to interrupt, but I just caught something that I didn't notice originally. Look at how when Tochino is swinging this beam back and forth, it switches from one side of his body to the other. Like it's in his right hand and then his left hand. And this isn't a matter of like saving time by just flipping the, the same drawing horizontally. They're different frames. Like his hand is in a different position. The shadows are different. I don't understand how this could have happened other than somebody just like forgot what position he was supposed to be in and like didn't look at the frame before. This is one of the weirdest things I've seen. Like every other mistake in here is like clearly a way to cut corners or something. This I just do not understand. All right, back to it. And Max, which is this delightful little guy's name, by the way, gives Nora some much needed exposition. <laughs> These OVAs were apparently some of the first instances of digital cell coloring in the Japanese animation industry, as evidenced by this one frame where somebody misclicked and colored a piece of Max's hair the same color as his skin. For reference, Studio Ghibli didn't start using digital technology until Princess Mononoke in 1997. 12 years later. But Max won't tell her Fuchiro's location out of fear for both of their lives. Uh oh. Her mouth slid halfway up her face. $5,000! And before you say that space inflation means that this isn't actually very much money, this line from the first sequence where her boss is referring to $10,000 says otherwise. What? <laughs> Man, I gotta find myself a manic pixie dream girl who will burn up $10,000 at a moment's notice with her magical powers while her eyes are looking in two different directions. Welcome to Can You Guess How Nora Convinces Max to Lead Her to Fuchiro's Hideout? Does she A. Offer him even more money B. Flatter him by scratching out a crude portrait of him in the sand with her foot C. Start banging on some pieces of scrap metal with socket wrenches and yell at him to dance. Or D, just straight up mind control him with her psychic powers. Type your answers in the comments now, along with your full name and home address, and I will personally mail 5,000 space dollars to every single person who gets it right. Nora, yamete chikyue kaire. Da, Nora. Max, odatte yo, Max. <laughs> yeah, get it, girl. Max, why aren't you dancing? Come on. Hey, go! Now that's a dance I can get into. I'm sorry, how is this in the bottom 10? Hell, how is this not in the top 10? They choreographed this and everything just for us. Man, anime fans are ungrateful. And the correct answer is C, but also kinda D. Nora and Max rock up to Fuchiro and Tochino's crib and, not to say that this animation is incredible or anything, but I'm really bewildered by the fact that they decided to start with their worst foot forward, foregoing in-betweens entirely for the opening sequence if they're actually capable of at least serviceable animation. Nora has a climactic battle with Fuchiro, which, lacking any establishment of the rules of the universe or magic system, basically plays out like a backyard game game of imagination between two eight-year-olds. Why doesn't she just get big too? 
Oh. I use my transmogrification to turn myself into a giant dragon and crush you in my claws. Oh yeah, well I teleport away and can see through all your illusions. Nora seems completely unfazed the entire time and it basically boils down to my psychic powers are better than your psychic powers. <laughs> The wink of death, of course. Oh my god. This just got really dark. Max defeats Tochino with his amazing smallness. And the two return to the creep bar, where everyone seems to have completely changed their ways now that Fuchiro and Tochino have been defeated. And of course, how could it not end with one more absolutely bewildering moment? <laughs> what? Uh, what? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, what just happened there? There is no explanation for this shot. Is this supposed to imply that, like, this was all a trance and Max is, is coming to, to reality? That's the end of... I feel like I'm being pranked. Got him. So that was Twinkle Nora Rock Me. I have to say, I wasn't expecting to start off with something so enjoyable. It was terrible, of course, with wildly inconsistent animation, at some points no animation whatsoever, and a plot that, while being incredibly basic and rudimentary, still manages to be incredibly confusing. But at the same time, just like Max, I can't help but fall victim to Nora's intoxicating spell. Nora, Nora, like a space. Twinkle in starlight. And I'd gladly tag along with her for no reason and put myself in mortal danger. Nora and Max will be living on forever in my heart. I'm gonna go ahead and say, this doesn't deserve to be in the bottom 10. I had fun, not deserved. Hey, if whatever comes next is anything like that one, I think we could actually be in for a pretty enjoyable ride. What came next was not anything like that one. Okay, I'm not sure how much of this I can actually show. Not only because it was exceedingly explicit, but also because there was so much visual noise on the screen that my recording software actually couldn't handle it. Interesting. Much to my surprise, I had stumbled into a four minute avant-garde art film. A warning for bright flashing lights, by the way, if you're sensitive to that sort of thing, you may want to jump ahead to the end of this chapter. Going in blind, Keiichi Tanami's Madonna was a full-on assault to the senses, featuring bright, hyperactive, overwhelming and oftentimes overlapping visuals. I feel like I'm being subliminally messaged here a bit. Rife with vivid, explicit metaphors. Very suggestive metaphors going on here. And backed by some exceedingly bizarre experimental music. Uh, uh... Uh, I could see why the almost one and a half thousand poor innocent citizens of my anime list who had stumbled across it while trying to take a shortcut through the back alleys on their way between Gintama degree symbol and Gintama period had been revolted and rated it so badly. But I was also intrigued and wanted to know more about this fellow. Keiichi Tanami. Wow, this is actually really cool. To understand what's happening here, we have to jump back to early 20th century Europe, where in response to the horrors of World War I, artists were beginning to reject the standards of logic and aesthetics in their art. After the Great War, people's perceptions of the world had changed and things didn't seem to make sense the way they used to. And this movement, later called Dada, as the nonsensical name suggests, reflected that by being patently absurd and nonsensical. An example you're probably familiar with is Marcel Duchamp's Fountain, which was just a urinal. You might say, that's stupid, I could have done that, my nephew could have done that, and you'd be right, because that was the point. Everything's insane and made up and makes no sense, including the concept of art itself. 20 years later, nine-year-old Keiichi Tanami was living through American air raids in Tokyo during World War II. He would later become a prominent illustrator, graphic designer, and video artist in the Neo-Dada movement, which I'm sure you can guess what that's all about based on the name. He's been extremely prolific in various visual media, and his work tends to combine the senseless and overwhelming imagery of war that defined his childhood and the tacky aesthetics of pop art, particularly and most obviously inspired by Andy Warhol. Thank you, my anime list bottom 10 for showing me a, a 
a cool new visual artist. There's a lot of debate over what is and isn't anime according to the way that the word is used outside of Japan, which I absolutely will not be engaging in because frankly, what's the point? But this certainly isn't what I or I think most people think of when they hear the word anime. Well, I think the main thing that that taught us was that my anime list is a farce. Absolute nonsense. Why is that even on there? But if anime just means any animation originating in Japan, then it qualifies. Tanami's Madonna may not be for everyone, and it's totally up to you if you even think it's any good as art. But if anything, in the same way that Dada was meant to point out the absurdity of war, aesthetics, and the art world, its very existence on this website, sat right next to something like Twinkle Nora Rock Me, points to the absurdity of even attempting to strictly classify media into clean categories in the first place. Again, I've only been able to show a tiny portion of it on here, but it is on YouTube if you want to go watch it yourself. Warning though, it is... It is a lot. I'm gonna go with not deserved for this one too. Not because I enjoyed watching it, but because that's not really the point, and it doesn't really even make sense to rate something like this on a 1 to 10 scale. That's like rating a car on how good it tastes. I'll admit what I'm about to say is cliche, but I really cannot think of a better way to express it. After watching Madonna, I felt like I was on drugs. I needed something that was just normal and bad. Enter. Did you guess it? By the way, I've also made a rule now that each entry must be more than a full minute long. This video isn't called I watched 10 30 second avant-garde short films. Maybe one day I'll make that video, but I doubt it would get many views. There are a few that got cut, the first of which would have gone here. I'll mention them briefly towards the end. For the uninitiated, X-Arm is a mostly 3D animated series produced and released by streaming giant Crunchyroll in 2021. It's based on a 2015 cyberpunk manga of the same name, which clearly learned some important lessons from Ghost in the Shell, namely that people like to look at drawings of naked women with heaps of USB cables plugged into them. As one of the distribution giant's first forays into production, it was supposed to make a splash. And make a splash it did. The kind where a guy in cargo shorts at the community pool does a half backflip belly flop from the highest diving board and takes a slightly worryingly long time to resurface. And everyone's like, did he mean to do that? Is, is he okay? Now, sitting here in the bottom 10 with 12 episodes, X-Arm is the lowest rated full TV anime series of all time and the only full series on this list. In September 2020, Crunchyroll released a trailer for the show at their virtual Crunchyroll Expo, which showed off some really unsettling action scenes, quickly became a laughing stock, and currently has an almost 7 to 1 dislike ratio on YouTube. Nice. Everyone was jumping on the hate train at the time. Toxic gossip train. But this was all a few years ago at this point. So now that the dust has all settled on this debacle, I think it's time we take a renewed look and objectively decide, is the show actually as bad as people said? I dove right in to find out. Yes, they were right. It's so bad. Holy hell, I could barely get through it. Natsume Akira, yes, that is his actual name, is an average high schooler with an aversion to technology and a desire to improve himself like his older brother, but no idea how to escape his mediocre life. Then he gets hit by a truck. Oh, I didn't know this was an isekai. Little did I know how true that statement would prove to be. He wakes up 16 years later, in the year 2030, to find out that he's now just a brain jammed into a computer of unknown alien origin, and has to help a bunch of cops and an android named Alma save the world and stuff. A lot has already been said about the technical elements of this show, so I'll try to focus more on substance and my own personal experience with it, but I just spent over four and a half hours of my life looking at this wretched, half-baked, whining pastiche of actual art, and there are some things I simply cannot stay quiet about or else my very soul will rend itself from my body and shoot into outer space to make a settlement on a new planet where anime was never invented. This uncanny valley matrix fight scene from the trailer drew a significant portion of the criticism at the time. Callum May lampooned it in their article Why Does the Crunchyroll Original Series X-Arm Look So Awful, for example. The thing is though, after watching the whole show, that scene, which appears in episode 3, is one of the more competent ones in the entire series. After episode 3, I was already struggling. Huh. 
Uh -huh. The first thing that stuck out to me was the mystifying choice to frequently put CGI characters right next to hand-drawn ones. They move in a very weirdly smooth, floaty, full 24 frames per second as if they're in a video game cutscene, while the 2D characters next to them are either animated in 8 frames per second or completely stock still single drawings. In my video about why the 3D animation in Chainsaw Man looked so good, I talked about the techniques the animators would use to make the 2D look closer to 3D and the 3D look closer to 2D so they would blend together to the point that you often couldn't even tell which was which. And there are plenty of other productions that have used 3D animation combined with creative tricks and effects to create some very visually appealing 2D images. Trigun Stampede comes to mind. But here it seems like they're actively doing the exact opposite and making the two styles look as different as they possibly can. And you know what? This is a world where there are humans and androids interacting with each other with conflict between the two. Using that cold, unsettling feeling that comes from the bad 3D animation could actually be a cool way to differentiate between the humans and androids if there was any logic whatsoever to which characters are 2D and which are 3D. As far as I can tell, the only pattern is that if a character appears on screen more than a handful of times, they'll make them 3D so that they can just make one character model instead of having to draw too many different frames of the character. They're so transparently just using whichever medium is cheaper and easier for any given element, and it feels like they earnestly thought we wouldn't be able to tell the difference. The only saving grace here is that the 2D characters are uncommon enough that it's not a constant distraction, you just get jump scared two to three times per episode. They also keep doing this really cool move where they zoom in really close on a texture, character, model, or render that clearly is not even close to high enough resolution to be able to handle such close inspection. Look, look at the picture. I had to take a bit of a research break before powering through the rest of the series. Along with that trailer in 2020, we had found out that of the main production staff, not a single person had one teaspoon of experience making anime. At the helm was Kimura Yoshikatsu, a live action director who seemed to mostly be known for a few mediocre martial arts films like Karate Girl and High Kick Girl. In an interview, Kimura stated that since the project deals with a lot of 3D, they wanted someone who had experience with live action films, so I was approached by the producers and I decided I'd come on board. A statement that makes absolutely no sense. Just because 3D animation is in 3D space, that doesn't mean it's not still animation. The animation studio Visual Flight was equally inexperienced with anime, or even animation itself, with their main claim to fame being that they had done some background work on Sekiro and a few other From Software games. And the main writer, Tommy Morton, is a ghost, an apparition. I literally cannot find a single other credit or anything to this name on the internet other than this actor from the 50s, which means that this person is either the biggest genius in all of this because they saw ahead of time what a train wreck this project would be and made up a pen name to go completely incognito mode, or he's just literally some guy they grabbed off the street. Both seem equally probable to me. You know, I kind of get what they're going for in a lot of these action scenes, particularly that one from the trailer, and you can see that there was at least some skill in the action choreography that went into this. If you put yourself in the mindset that you're watching a live action movie, some of the simplest shots are kind of cool here. If this was a fan animation modeled and animated by a single rambunctious teenager, it would be mildly impressive. Apparently Kimura took a full live action approach, directing these scenes with actors in motion capture suits, thinking that would make something, quote, extremely realistic. But setting aside the fact that something extremely realistic is not what anyone wants from their sci-fi action cartoons, it's insane to think that you can just capture some motion capture data from a real life actor, paste it onto your highly stylized anime character models and call it a day. As I'm sure the crew quickly found out, you still have to do a lot of manual keyframing and stylization to take that raw data and make it into something that's actually visually appealing. Completely unequivocal to do so, they make do with some really basic keyframes where objects and body parts move simply from point A to point B, lacking any principles of animation, and contrasting wildly with the very detailed motion capture data. Like in this shot, for example, Alma does some crazy side hand
sand springs up a banister, which obviously they couldn't have an actor do in real life, so it ends up feeling like she's floating through the air with all the weightless, jerky finesse of the very earliest Macromedia Flash stick fight animations from 2005. Actually, that might be giving it too much credit. Some of those animations were sick. And this extends to the facial animation too. Hey look, if I point the eyebrows down, now they're angry. And if I point them up and open the mouth, now they're surprised. And why does this fight and every other fight in this show just take place in a big empty space? I feel like one advantage of live action is that you can more easily have your characters interact with their surroundings, but we're really getting the worst of both worlds here. Up to this point, I had been driven by the novelty of something so visually awful that I had never seen anything like it. But that novelty was starting to wear thin at this point, but there was nothing to do but dive right back in. As I started to become somewhat accustomed to the visual cacophony, what began to stick out to me more was the plot and characters. Because let me be clear, the ineptitude in the animation department is not what makes X-Arm bad. If this show had Demon Slayer, Jujutsu Kaisen, Mob Psycho level animation, it would still be an unbearable bowl of bland slop. If you took the superficial elements of Akira, Ghost in the Shell, and Psycho Pass, blended them up into a mush, and pasted that paper mache style over the feeble skin skeleton of a mediocre isekai, this is what you would get. Our boy Akira is your standard bland self-insert character who, upon getting suddenly teleported to a version of the world that's basically unrecognizable to the version he was used to 16 years ago due to a handful of all-powerful alien devices called X-Arms, and a cataclysm in 2020 that he apparently caused but has no memory of, finds himself surrounded by a gaggle of what I assume are supposed to be pretty girls, most of whom are inexplicably in love with him, basically from the moment he shows up, despite him having shown almost no personality whatsoever. Well, except for a vague desire to improve himself and do the right thing. Uh -huh. By the way, that cataclysm in 2020 looks like this. And they're apparently very proud of how it looks because they replay this shot at least twice per episode. Being a dangerous alien cyber weapon, Akira is essentially enslaved by the Tokyo Police Department. And as he helps them defend Tokyo against a series of bland and ill-conceived terrorist attacks, he finds out that, surprise surprise, in this new world, he's one of the most powerful beings in the universe and has a super hacking power that seems to just work like an invisible psychic beam that travels through the air and allows him to just take control of any machine in sight. That includes the body of Alma, the sexy pantsless android, but in order for the two to combine, Alma first has to kiss her partner Minami. No, I'm not joking. And no, they don't really even try to justify that at all. Episode 5 is a dream sequence where the crew puts Akira in a computer simulation to try to recover his memories, which allows them to play what if all these characters were in a high school anime, and pokes fun at how that genre creates an unrealistic view of what high school is really like. <laughs> This could have been mildly amusing, if not for the fact that the show itself is just as generic and tropey as the shows it's mocking here. Oh, Akira was once 2D and had facial expressions, apparently. I was past the halfway point now, but the further I got, the more the tunnel seemed to stretch out in front of me with no light in sight. I think my brain was starting to go a little soupy at this point because I kind of just went silent, and the only note I took between episodes 6 and 9 was that in this shot, Akira kind of looks like that Walter White meme. Pretty good joke, huh? Leave a like for that one. The show is of course underpinned by the aesthetics of the hysterical fear of AI domination that has defined the first quarter of the 21st century, but it clearly doesn't actually care about it as a theme, because when Alma gets hacked and turns evil for a bit, then gets anti-hacked back to being a good guy, and suddenly gains autonomy over her own actions and becomes a fully self-aware being for no reason, Yggdrasil, the supercomputer turned physical yandere lolly girl, unironically says she can kill a person without being ordered to, of her own free will, as if that's a good thing, and we never think about that any harder. In this instance, at least, it happened to be a bad guy that she killed of her own free will, so it's probably fine that we've invented a fully autonomous, super-powered android that now has the ability to indiscriminately kill anyone it feels like. With my brain irreparably damaged, I snapped out of my fugue state when I noticed that I was about to start the 12th and final episode. After two separate climactic 
climactic battles, one against a big Akira style blob monster made out of cables instead of flesh, the other against a bunch of digital giants that don't actually exist but sorta do and are a representation of all the evils of humanity distilled into a program, they go, you forgot one thing, evil scientist guy. Humanity is bad in some ways, but it's also, you know, good in other ways. Ha <laughs> ha! And win through the power of friendship. Akira sacrifices himself to save the world, the end. Finally, let's wrap this up with a technical error and or stupid nonsensical plot contrivance lightning round. The screen is mirrored at the top because of the camera shake effect. This keeps happening throughout the show and is not a stylistic choice. They couldn't be bothered to add camera shake in the scene itself and just pasted a preset onto the rendered footage in post. This would be fine for a travel vlog, not for this. Oops, the cell shading filter decided to make the science lady's mouth disappear. This guy has a super smelling power because he's from the desert? The perspective here is all wrong, making the characters look like they start tiny and get bigger as they walk towards the camera. Oops, we broke the 180 degree rule. Akira goes all Evangelion at one point when he controls a battle bot and has to be rescued by boobs, but the risk of him losing control just never comes up again. I knew what I was getting into here, but it didn't make it any less painful. I thought about doing a bit where I would sarcastically defend X-Arm and pretend it's a masterpiece, but I realized that not only is that an overdone bit, but also that I don't think I could physically bring myself to do it. As a production, this was ill-advised, rotten to the core, and never should have been made. The animation is obviously the most egregious affront to humanity, but there are so many other things wrong here that I'm genuinely struggling to keep this segment from taking over the entire video, and I didn't notice until now that I somehow forgot to mention that the editing is horrendous often leaving full second pauses between every single line of dialogue and that there's just permanently an infuriating realistic haze filter or three pasted over the screen for about 80% of the show which moves with the camera and covers up as much of the awful CG characters as they can get away with because they were clearly embarrassed with how this turned out. But that just begs the question, why did you release it? The only conclusion I can come to is that the intended viewing experience for this show is to get cataracts so that all you can see is a blurry, partially obscured mess of colors. I took a quick look at the manga to see if it's any better, and while it probably technically is, characters' backstories and motivations certainly seemed better fleshed out, and the art is pretty good, obviously light years ahead of the show, it still seems to be built on that same generic paper mache skeleton I mentioned earlier, and is even more horny. Both Alma and Minami's shirts accidentally happen to get ripped open in the first couple chapters, for example, so I just steer clear altogether. As I sit here in a tepid puddle of regrets for having ever thought this was a good idea, my only solace is that everyone universally recognized that this was one of the worst pieces of garbage in the history of the medium, and for that, I am thankful. Anime fans, for once you were right on this one. Fully deserved. In fact, I'd put it even lower if I could. Get me out of here. Thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned for part two where I delve even deeper into the pits of despair and finally arrive at the number one worst anime of all time. It should be up about two weeks from the posting time of this video. If it's already out, it'll be on the screen right now. If not, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss when it comes out.